yourself as you feel like God wants you to go. And if you pray about it, I promise you, you'll do something that costs you something. You hear me? You'll do something that costs you something. Teresa and I made a commitment. I'm not telling you how much it was. We talked between the two of us. We made a commitment for what we felt like that we wanted to give that God had laid on our hearts. And did you know that just after we talked about that, just after we prayed about that, my heat and air unit went completely kaplunk. And the devil says, uh-huh, I got you now. So the prices are coming in anywhere between six and eight to $11,000 for a heat and air unit. But you know what? God's still on the throne. He's still high and lifted up. He purchased the first heat and air unit that we had sitting there, and he'll do it again. So I'm not going to preach. <laughs> well, welcome tonight. Uh, I've got a few in here that have hearing disabilities, and so I'm going to try to consciously speak loud enough for them. How, how's that better? Can you hear me good? Okay. My father, he had a lot of hearing issues, and it's very frustrating when you can't hear and you want to you want to hear. But so welcome tonight. It's Wednesday night. It's so good to be in God's house. It's so good to see people getting out and coming together and and fellowshipping together, and it's just so different than watching it on Facebook. Are we on Facebook? So welcome, Facebook family. Uh, I know that uh, Keith and Patty, they're out there in the Grand Canyon area, Texas area. Welcome. They, they are watching tonight. Marty talked to them today. R.C. and Macy's always watching. I'm sure Robert's watching. So we do have a family that's watching. I've got family and, and some girls that we counsel that's watching. So welcome tonight. Uh, we're continuing the series that we've been teaching on. I just want to I just want to comment. It's so good to have Sister Teresa in here. Uh, it's so good because a lot of times, Mama, being a, a pastor's wife, never got to be in uh, in the congregation. She would always be ministering, and she would miss out on that. So it's so good and good to have Helen back there with the weather. We didn't know if that would work out or not, but so it's good to be here tonight, Sunday morning. What a message! Pastor, that was such a message, almost saved. We don't hear messages like that much anymore. That's not the popular message, but I tell you what, it's a much needed message. Kind of goes along with what I'm teaching tonight, and he had no clue about that. So many of you have commented on uh, the teaching, and, and I'm honored. A teacher is, is always honored when you say that you go home and you're challenged, uh, that you it spoke to your heart, so... That's always a blessing for a teacher. Uh, it's a heavy air day today, if any of you notice. I, my heart goes out to your loved one that has COVID. When the air pressure is heavy, it's hard to speak. So if I get a little short-winded, I have to practice and remember to take some deep breaths. But uh, we're continuing our study on the portraits through the Bible. Uh, it's taken from a teaching, an old, old teaching back in 2003. Not that old, but... Max Licato had a teaching, He Still Moves the Stones, uh, and that's what mainly these teachings are. It's about portraits of when Jesus met with people and their lives were totally transformed. Uh, again, the passage was Matthew 12, 20. It's called Bruised Reeds and Smoldering Wicks. Many of you may not have ever even heard about that. Bruised weeds, it's a, it's a prophecy from Isaiah. A bruised a reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. That was speaking of Jesus. So as we get ready to go through tonight's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So I'm just going to do one story because it, it is so multifaceted. It's like, where do I take off on the rabbit hole on this story? But I think you might enjoy it tonight. It's probably one that you've heard many times. But before we go into the story, you don't want to hear me. I want you to take a deep breath, shake off today's cares, for the next little bit, we're going to talk about what God wants each one of us to hear. Father God, we come to you right now, and we're so honored that you're here. It's so good to be in your house. Father, there's so many challenges and things going on with the war that's happening, and so many people are sick and struggling, but you already know all that. So Lord, as we come to you tonight, we just ask that our hearts settle down and our mind open up to hear you. Lord, speak into our hearts something that we can take with us the rest of the week, the rest of our life. Lord, we're honored that you even allow us to learn. 
We love you so much. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight's lesson, the portrait that we're going to learn about is called Bright Lights on a Dark Night, when you are totally out of choices. Have you ever been like that? You ever felt like you're just totally out of choices? You've tried everything you know. It's a dark night, and when, it, when it's dark like that, it's lonely. So tonight's lesson is taken from a recorded story that John recorded in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18, and I'm reading this from the New Living Translation. Jesus heals a lame man. We've heard this story. If you've read many of the stories, John's one of my favorite books. Sometimes it's easy to just read it and kind of brush over it and think, oh, lame man got healed. I hope tonight that you will never read this story the same way. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the Pool of Bethsaida with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on these porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for such a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles. Someone else always gets ahead of me. And Jesus looked at him and told him, Stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and he began walking. But you see, this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders, well, they objected. They said to the man who was cured, You can't work on the Sabbath. The law does not allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But the man replied, Well, the man who healed me told me to pick up my mat and walk. And they demanded, Who said such a thing? And the man said, I don't know. He went off into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple, and he told him, Now that you are well, stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. And then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who healed him. Oh, there is so much going on in this story. You could teach for a week on each aspect of what's going on in this story, but the craziest thing is a man that was lame, that was paralyzed for 38 years, he got healed, and the religious leaders are so mad that it happened on a Sabbath. They don't care anything about him getting healed. They just are mad because he did it on a day. They said he couldn't do it. So he, they don't even care about a human being. But for the sake of time and for tonight's lesson, we're just going to focus on verses 6 and verses 7. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long, long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? And he said, I can't, sir. I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles. Someone always gets there ahead of me. Now, for the longest time, this story made no sense to me. Water bubbling, people getting in and getting healed. Man, there 38 years. I mean, what's he do all day long? Somebody just set him out there? or I mean, does he just show up? Does he live there? Is it homeless? It just didn't make sense. I mean, this man barely has enough faith to even stand on, much less Jesus healing him. There's sick people everywhere. So you think, man, this, this is just too bizarre. But if you think about this lesson, this story is not about an invalid in Jerusalem. you got to listen with your spiritual ears now. This story is about you, and this story is about me. And the faceless man that it never tells us his name, what he looks like, his face has our face on it because he has a problem just like we do. Now, from now on, every time you hear the pull of Bethsaida, you're going to think something different. That's what my prayer is with this lesson. 
Jesus encounters this man, and it's a very large pool. It's north of the temple in Jerusalem. It's actually 360 feet long. So I said, Marty, how long is that? Give me some idea of how long that is. And he said, well, a little bit longer than a football field. That's how big this pool is. And it's 130 feet wide, so about half the width. And it's 75 feet deep. This is not a little backyard pool. This is a pool. So it has a colonnade around it, and it has five porches, five covered porches. So it's really a monument of wealth and prosperity. This is supposed to be a beautiful porch, a beautiful pool, but laying around it are all the sick and diseased people. Now get that picture in your mind. They call it Bethsaida. In today's world, it could be Central Park. It could be a wing at Blunt Memorial Hospital. It could be Joe's Bar and Grill. Let this become real to you. It could be anywhere where homeless people huddle. You know, when we go feed the homeless and it's under the bridges in Knoxville. It could be any church. It could be Rio East. It could be any place where there is a collection of hurting people. And I dare say in here tonight, we've got some hurting people. We've got some praise reports. Yes, we do. But I bet we've got some hurting people when those smiles come off the face and we settle down and Jesus starts walking around the pews and touching you and ministering to you. It could be anywhere that there's hurting people. You see, there was an underground spring that caused this pool to bubble occasionally. But back in the Bible days, the people believed these bubbles happened when the angels' wings touched the water. And they believed that the first person to get into that pool, once it was troubled, they got healed. Now, I don't know if they did or not. It doesn't really say whether they did or not. But I do know there was a bunch of invalids laying around the pool, and they were ready to give it a try. So just picture this in your mind. There's all these sick people looking at the pool. Now, I don't know if they were in it or not. It said the first one in, once it bubbled, they got healed. So were they just standing there looking, waiting on it to bubble? And if you can't move and you're paralyzed and you're laying there for 38 years, that, that's got to be a pretty hopeless situation. Now, if you just take a moment and you think about a battlefield where there's wounded and there's hurting, and if you look on the news, you can see some of that. If you look on, get on the internet and see what's really happening that, that we're not seeing maybe, that's a battlefield where people are wounded and laying out. Or Don and Renita, you see this all the time. Go to a nursing home. Yeah, go to a nursing home, one that's understaffed and overcrowded. And look at the hopelessness and the frustration and the stress. That's like the pool of Bethsaida. That's what people saw when they passed by Bethsaida. What'd they hear when they passed by it? Probably a lot of groaning and moaning. See, my mom and dad were in a nursing home, and I spent many a nights there with them. They'd let me. I got to know the staff on a first-name basis. Me and Marty, we were there so much, they thought we were part of the staff. I was cutting hair and giving massages. I was doing whatever it took to make sure they took care of my mom and daddy. But I tell you what, when you're there at night, it's a scary place because them lights kind of go down and those people start moaning and groaning and crying. It's a very helpless situation, and I can only imagine that this place was like that. So what did you see if you were walking around it? Probably a bunch of people with faces you wouldn't even remember. They're just the faceless hurting that's in society. What do most people do? Don, do you have a waiting list of people signed up to go do the nursing home ministry? No, because that's, that's a messy ministry, isn't it? Now, a lot of people don't like messy ministries. They want a good one where you're noticed. They want to stand in the pulpit or be in the choir. The ministry doesn't really happen up here, folks. The ministry happens when you get out into the world of the hurting people. Jesus did not always stand and teach. He got into the mess. And so, blessed, blessed to you all, because God works in those places. But what did Jesus do? Most people walk by and they ignore it. 
If you ever go and, and go downtown, we went to a dinner the other night, and uh, homeless people, you know, I mean, they were up under the bridge, and they, they weren't moving, and, I, and we were parking close by, and I said, Marty, there's somebody up under there. He said, really? Yeah. People don't see them. I mean, crowds walking by going to a fancy restaurant, and people don't even see what's happening around them. We get so used to just overlooking it. Did Jesus do that? Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's not there to teach. He's not there to disciple anybody. He's there for some feast because there were three feasts, three festivals that men had to go to Jerusalem to be a part of if they were Jewish, and that was the Passover and unleavened bread, the Pentecost and the Feast of Shelters. So that Jesus was there for that reason. And Jesus is walking among the hurting at Bethsaida. He's walking among the suffering. I, I, wonder, I wonder what he's thinking. What would Jesus be thinking if he's just walking around him? Maybe an infected hand reaches out and touches his ankle as he goes by because they're laying on the ground. I wonder what he does. I wonder when a blind man is trying to stumble and runs into him, does he steady him and say, you know, hey, but it's okay, it's okay. What about when a wrinkled hand reaches up for money because that's what they're used to doing? Do you ever think how Jesus might respond? I wonder, why didn't he heal all of them? Why did he pick out one? We might find out in the rest of this story. Whether the watering hold is Bethsaida or whether it's Bill's Bar down the street, how does God feel when people are hurting? Where is God when we're hurting? How does he feel? You know, it's really worth telling this story if all we do is watch how Jesus walks among them because you got to get this picture in your mind. It's worth the story just knowing that he showed up because he didn't have to. He didn't have to. There's a lot better sanitary crowds where, where he's at. He doesn't have to go to Bethsaida. You don't walk by it. You go to it. It's the north part. There's a lot of activities going wrong. There's festivals. There's partying. Where does Jesus go? People have come for miles around to see God in the temple. And God's not in the temple. Guess where God is? God's out there with the sick people. A little bit ironic, isn't it? Little do they know that God is walking very slowly around the blind and the lame and the paralyzed. Little do they know that this strong, young carpenter that's walking among the sick people is God Almighty. When they suffer, he suffered also. That's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 63, 9. And on this day, Jesus was suffering much. You see, this is not the world that Jesus and his Father created. This is after the fall. There wasn't supposed to be any sickness or moaning or groaning or wailing or hurting. So Jesus is walking along this pool and watching these people. And I can only imagine that, you know, when you just, it's not what you dreamed and you just sigh, you know, I can just hear him watching and looking and hurting. And it says, one day, as Jesus walked along the pool of Bethsaida, he stopped and saw a man that had been there 38 years. He knew that man had been there that long. I bet he looked over the crowd and thought, I wonder who's been here the longest suffering. Isn't that funny? Remember I told you this story's about us and that I said if you look real close, you'll find each of our faces in this story? Well, if you look between the white spaces in verse number 5, it says there was a man who had been laying there for 38 years. Now, I know I keep harping on that because I want you to hear that. That person is just like us, and maybe you don't like being described like that. Maybe you want to be more like David, or maybe you want to be more like Mary. You don't want to be described like an invalid. We all want to look like the heroes in the Bible, don't we? But did you know before we can be like the heroes in the Bible that we have to be like an invalid? I want you to think about this. Invalids are out of options. Invalids need Jesus. And without Jesus, all we do is exist. Every day we exist. 
We get up, we get dressed, we go to work, we do our thing, we come home, we eat, we go to bed, we get up, we do it again. Can you imagine going through life with no hope? You, you don't want to even go to the mailbox because what's in the mailbox? Another bill. That's why you go to work, so you can pay those bills. There's nothing to look forward to. Same old shows on the TV every day. You don't even want to look at your emails or answer your phone. It's always something, always another problem. I work with people like that all day long, people without Jesus. And I think, how do they do it? How did I used to do it before I knew the Lord? Because as Pastor Dell taught, almost saved is not saved. And we've got to be very, very careful that we're not almost saved and miss out on what God has planned. God did not just do what he did so that we could get on our lifeboat and be saved in heaven. If you are not living a peaceful and abundant and happy and joyful life, what's wrong? Why do so many Christians we have a ho-hum, hmm, my life is bad. We went into church one time, and I hate to say this, but Rio East has a lot to offer people, and people are always looking for a church. Whether you, like, whether you realize that or not, people like to be invited to go places. What they don't know is if they come in here, God will get a hold of them. We've got amazing worship music. The spirit that God has in here is so sweet. I used to tell Sister Teresa, i got to come to church to get filled back up. I'd be so empty because some of the churches we went in, and I'm not putting this down. I'm not trying to be a judge. I'm just telling you, we don't have much, but we have Jesus. I mean, it's like, what? what? You don't even act like you want to have much. Yes, you have much. You have Jesus, but if what you have is not what people see that they want, why would they come? We have to be different. We have to be different than the world. And if you're not different than the world, then you might be almost saved. Because when you're saved, you'll act like it. You're not walking dead anymore. You've got the remedy. So when people come in and brush up against you, and they're in a bad mood because that McDonald's lady's taking three minutes to get that, that one-minute hamburger ready, and they're looking at you, and you're like, get out of my way, I was here first. Are you showing Jesus? No, maybe you should say, here, honey, I'm sorry. Here, go ahead, you're in front of me. Or better yet, when they're behind you and the, and the woman's got three kids and she don't even want a McDonald's hamburger, why don't you just bite? Don't even say anything, just say, I'm going to take care of that. And then go sit down, not to make a big show, but just to show them something's different. If you will show Jesus to people who are hurting, you can be like Jesus walking through the pool. There's people hurting. You don't know it. We don't wear our cuts on our shoulders and our face. We wear our cuts in our hearts. And so, so many times, even coming in here, if you look around and you walk around, there's people hurting. I'm not saying put on an act. No, if you're hurting, you get up here and get healed. Let the Lord touch you. I'm saying be different in your peacefulness. Be different in how you hold on to the joy. Look for the little miracles. Get up and instead of seeing the wind blowing in the bad news reports, thank the Lord that the sun is out too. Thank the Lord that we can feel the wind. Thank the Lord that you can breathe. When you almost lose that, life takes on a different look. How many times have you looked at your partner and just really looked at them. I bet you've looked at Cindy in different eyes. Something when you think you might not have that person sitting next to you and squeeze them a little bit tighter and say, baby, I love you. I'm glad you're here. Because you know what? God's honored with that. When we think we've got it bad, there's always somebody that's got it worse. I want to challenge you. Some of us have, have jobs. Some of us are retired. If you're retired, get with Don and Renita. Go to the nursing home just unexpectedly. They've got the pass to get in. Go walk around the quarters. Just smile at the people. Just tell them, we love you. We've not forgot you. If you're at work, go indifferent. When that employee gets there five minutes late, and you're gonna, you are going to write them up. I've had it with you. Stop for just a minute and wonder what's going on in their world. Take them aside. Everything okay? You know, one of the biggest witnesses that I had with a woman, 
uh, she worked with another co-worker, and that co-worker was difficult by, by ever imagination. She was difficult. She was a backstabber, and she backbite. She gossiped. She was hateful. But this was a good Christian woman. And she, she didn't ever talk, tell on her. She didn't want to get her in trouble or anything. But this woman was mean to her. I would have written her up if she had let me, but I couldn't do it without her permission. Well, the mean lady's car broke down. Yeah, her car broke down. She didn't have money to get a taxi. And I'm sitting there thinking, <laughs> she may just lose her job over this. You know what that Christian woman did? Kind of put me to shame, too. She offered to take her to and from her house, out of her way. Your car is being worked on here. I'll pick you up. I'll take you. She heaped some coals of fire on that woman and anybody else that thought she was going to get even, didn't she? That's what Jesus asked us to do. Be different. But let's go back to this message. What does this invalid and you have in common? If you're in good health right now, enjoy it. Enjoy it. All the, all the sickness that we hear. Robert never thought he'd have that toothache, did he? You get a toothache, everything hurts. Just like Pastor said, you get a backache, you let your feet hurt. Everything hurts. If you're in good health, enjoy it. Because you may not be in health for, in good health forever. And you may be sitting here and saying, I don't have anything in common with those sick people. I don't have anything in common with this invalid. Yes, you do. Yes, you do, because our, the common ground that we have is the predicament that he's in and the hope that he has. It's described in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 14. Anyone whose life is not holy, anyone whose life is not holy, guess what? You will never see the Lord. That's pretty scary, isn't it, Pastor? I had to look that up because I thought that ain't right. We've gotten so used to think as long as we're good and as long as we try our best. Hebrews 12, 14 says, anyone whose life is not holy will never see the Lord. That's our predicament. Only the holy will see God. You see, holiness is a prerequisite to get into heaven. Just like before you can work with me, you've got to meet certain pre-employment prerequisites. Well, holiness is one to get into heaven. At some point to get into heaven, you personally have to renounce your sin and you personally have to give your life over to Jesus. It can't be grandma did it. It can't be mom and daddy did it. You personally have to come face to face with your sin individually, turn your life over to the Lord, let him clean you up, and you have to acknowledge that he is your Lord and Savior. And as Lord and Savior, where does he have, what place does he have in your life? Those are tough questions, aren't they? I remember when church wasn't even, not attending wasn't even an option. I mean, it never entered my mind that people didn't go to church Every time the doors was open, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we just went. I remember the first time I had a girlfriend that had a ball game, and she wanted to know if I wanted to go to the ball game, and I thought, you don't go to church? Of course, my daddy said no, and as I got into my teen years, we had quite the little problems with it because we had singing on Friday night, and Friday night's when you go to the ball game. So, but I remember when church was not even an issue whether or not you came or not. You showed up. We've gotten away from holiness, haven't we? We've gotten away from putting God and having that reverence and that fear of God because we don't like the word fear. We want him to be our buddy. Or we want him to be our friend. Yes, he's all of that, but he still is, should be reverenced. He is still Almighty God. He still should be first and foremost where you want to be, what you want to be reading, how you want to be spending your free time, have you ever thought about that? We got vacation. What are we going to do on vacation? Do you ever go to church on vacation? Because you see, if you got the Holy Spirit living in you, he goes wherever you go. You go on vacation, you think it's okay to go down to the little nightclub because it's out on the beach and everybody's there having a few drinks and you ain't going to know nobody. And you look around and you think it's okay. You don't think God hurts. You don't think the Holy Spirit cringes because that's not who he is. Holiness is is a prerequisite to get into heaven. Pastor Dale talked about almost saved. We wish that it maybe wasn't like that. We act like it's not like that sometimes. We act like if you're just a decent person that you can be saved. I've actually heard people say, I ain't as bad as her. I, I don't do what she does. 
Yeah, I've heard people say that. We suggest if you just try your best, just try as hard as you can. But the problem is you. It's not try as hard as you can. You see, we don't have the power to save ourselves. Some even think goodness qualifies you to get into heaven. And it sounds good. It sounds right. If you listen to a lot of pastors on TV or iPads or whatever, just be good. Just be happy. Don't worry about sin. It's all covered. Grace and mercy covers it. Yes, grace and mercy covers our sins. But that doesn't mean you can keep on sinning. There's a big difference in holiness and living holy and taking a step back and saying, don't want to be there, don't want to do that. I had a good friend of mine. She said, I don't, it don't bother me to drink. It don't bother me at all to drink. And I thought, she said, does it bother you? And I said, why doesn't it bother you to drink? What is it that you think the Lord didn't want us to be drinking or doing drugs? You know, he wants us in a sound, sober mind, doesn't it? But what if what you do causes another weaker person to stumble? God gives us warning about that too. We need to really realize that God is holy. And if we are his and we've put our name on as Christian, that we are representing him. I wear this ring. I work around a bunch of men. And I've had to tell my husband, I will never dishonor this ring. I will never dishonor you. When people want to meet with me one-on-one, that door does not shut if it's a man. Mm -mm. If I didn't want him to do it, I won't do it. I won't go to lunch with people just because they want to have lunch. I'll ask them, he'll, men will come up, you want to go have lunch? We'll talk about this over lunch. Let me call my husband, see if he's free. Sometimes they don't like that, and I don't really care. He, I wear his name. How I act with or without him is how I represent him. We wear the name of Jesus. We are God's child. How we act, even when people are not watching, he sees especially when people are watching. Never be ashamed to pray over your food. Never. Even if you have to say, excuse me just a minute, and, and quietly, you don't have to make a big scene. You don't have to make people feel uncomfortable. We were at that big dinner party, and it was, it was one of those where you think, what could we have done with this money? I mean, I bet it was $150 a person. It was a big board of, meet, board of directors meeting. People, rattlesnake, as Marty said, it probably wasn't rattlesnake, it's probably chicken. They just charged them rattlesnake fees. I don't know, I didn't eat it. Rattlesnake and all this other weird stuff. But you know, when we got ready to eat, several of us were Christ- are Christian and we were looking around because we thought, I mean, it was open bar. It was, we didn't drink. And I noticed several at our table did not drink either. And one that was a very influential person said, Excuse me, just a moment. He stood up, didn't have a drink. He stood up. He said, I'd like to say a word of prayer. Buddy, that silenced everything. Don't ever be ashamed of who you are and who you represent because there's a warning about that. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. You never know who's watching, ever. We, like the invalid, we're stuck. We can't compare ourselves to anybody but God. Matthew 5, 48 says, you must be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. I'm not perfect. Eileen said, how, do you, how are you so nice all the time? I'm not nice all the time. Ask Marty. It says in Matthew 5, you must be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. God, in God's plan, God sets the standards, not everybody else. You don't compare yourselves to everybody else because they're just as messed up as we are. And if you do, if you do start looking toward people, They'll always disappoint you. Always. That's why so many people get hurt in church. They get hurt by people in church because they come to church to be with the people in the church. They come to church to fellowship in church. They come to church to be part of the crowd. They don't come to church to worship the king. They come to church for every other reason but the king. If nobody showed up, would you still come to worship the king? We were talking about the snow and how so many churches canceled Sunday morning and Sunday night. Well, by noon, there was no snow, you know. The older generation are are used to going to church no matter what. I remember when it would snow, there might be three people in church, 
and Daddy would preach himself silly. And I would think, this is crazy. There's nobody here. God was there. When we're not, when these seats, we can't see who's in here. Do you not think the angels are lined up saying, can I go to, can I go to Rio East tonight? Can I fit in there? Because if the people don't come, the angels will. So you might be sitting next to several big ones or small ones or happy ones. Don't ever think that you're in this by yourself. Because the moment that you start feeling like it's too much trouble, then you're not worshiping God. Keep that in mind. That's you and me laying on the ground, by the way. It's not the invalid. It's you and me. When it comes to healing our spiritual condition, we don't stand a chance. We don't even have what it takes to be healed. Our only hope is that God will do for us what he did for that man at the pool of Bethsaida, that he will step out and offer. Do you want to get well? Read slowly with me what Apostle Paul described what God has actually done for each one of us. It's in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. You may want to write that down. You may want to go back and look at it. Paul said you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away, but God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against you and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Just listen. Who's doing the work? You or God? God. Who's doing the saving? You or God? Who has the one with all the strength? Who's the one that is paralyzed? You starting to feel like the guy at the pool? Isolate a few of these phrases. When you were spiritually dead and not free... Well, the invalid, he wasn't dead. He was alive. He's a little bit better off than we are if we're spiritually dead. Paul says that if you and I are on the outside of Christ, we are spiritually dead. You ever watch that movie, The Wait, what is it, Walking Dead? That's an awful movie, ain't it? Walking Dead. Who would watch that? Walking Dead. You know what? We live in a world of walking dead people. That's okay. You come on in, sis. Walking dead. If, the, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are walking dead. You're existing. There are people that you rub shoulders with every day that are walking dead. They don't have the remedy. They don't even know what it is. You already have it. Why would you not at least talk to your neighbor? The one that you get the mail, you wave, you know, You forgot your trash can, you know. At least tell them, hey, come to Rio East. If you're too chicken to do anything else, invite them here. That's the first step. But we should always, always be ready to say what Jesus means to us. They should see it on our face. They should see it in our walk. They should see it in how we work. We should be the ones that gets there early and leaves late. We should not be one that gets there right on time. We should not be the one 30 minutes back from lunch a little bit too late. We should be setting the example. I did a lesson one time. Do you put your shopping cart back where it goes? If you get, if you get the cereal and this one's on sale, do you just set it down wherever? Because people see that. If you're going out to eat on Sunday and you bow your head and you make a big deal and you pray and you leave a $2 tip, what do you think that said to your waitress? No, we should be ones where we're so blessed, we bless other people. You should be the one that leaves that extra tip, even if it's all the lunch money you've got. So when that waitress looks, what they tip me 20 bucks. Leave a little note, God loves you, just wanted you to know that. Leave a little track, Rio East, that's where we go. When that waitress comes over and she's working herself silly because that's what they're doing right now, reach out and touch her arm and say, you know what? You're doing an excellent job. I just want you to know that. Do a little bit extra. Look what God did with the dead people. God made you alive. He forgave you. He canceled your debt. He took away the record. He stripped the spiritual rulers. He showed the world that he won the victory. God has thrown life jackets to every generation. 
Now we're going to get into a couple of stories. I want you to read, let these stories come alive to you. Jonah in the belly of a fish. One of the hardest ones for me to really believe. But hey, it's in the Bible. Now listen to this. He got to stay in that fish's belly for three days. I mean, you got to imagine, if you're in a bathtub for a couple hours, you get like all wrinkled skin. I can't imagine what he must have looked like. All them gastric juices. It said he had seaweed around his neck. Yeah. And where he's sitting or floating, he's got two ways to exit. And there ain't neither one appropriate. But you know what? Jonah kind of got himself in that situation. He blew it as a preacher. Read the story. He blew it. At worst, he's a traitor. At best, he's a coward. <clears throat> and what he lacked, he's in the middle of it, guts. He is sitting in the middle of guts. God does have a sense of humor. Now, he's in there in all them guts, and he does what he didn't do in before. He starts praying, and he ain't saying how good he is. He's saying how good God is. He knows he's in trouble. And before he even says amen, that big old whale belches, and throws him out face first on the sand. That's in your Bible too. Let's talk a little bit about Daniel in the lion's den. Now, I don't know why I never got this. I've always seen Daniel in that picture where he's standing like this, and the lions are laying at his feet. That's what I thought happened, but listen to this rendition of it. His prospects aren't much better than Jonah's. Jonah's been swallowed, and Daniel's about to be. Daniel's flat on his back. They threw him in the lion's den. They don't just open the door. They threw him in there and put a stone over. It's what they did. And these are hungry lions. So he's in the lion's den, and he's laying there. He smelled their breath. And one big old lion, you can just see, comes over and puts his hand down on Daniel, leans up in his face, and gets ready to take a bite, and he can't open his mouth. You remember what it says happened? It says the angel, it's in verse 21, Daniel 6, my God sent an angel to shut the lion's mouth. So you got to picture this. Now, there's more than one lion, so big old fuzzy lion, he can't bite. So mama lion comes up and bumps him over and looks at him, and she tries it, and her mouth won't open. And Daniel's thinking, what? And he hears this snickering, and he sees something bright over in the corner, and he doesn't really know what it is, but the lions are moving back, and they come over, and they sit down around the angel. The angel's having a ball. And Daniel's being saved. Look at Joseph in the pit. This ain't no easy pit. This ain't like a little, little dugout pit. This is a big old pit. Now, I mean a big pit. And his brothers have, are going to throw him in it. They've already thrown him in this pit. They've pulled the lid over the top of it. These are his brothers. They're up here laughing and eating and joking, kind of like they just told him to get lost. He's in the pit. The pit's got spiders in it, maybe a few snakes hanging down in there. There's no water in it, so it's got to hurt when he landed. He probably broke something when he landed because they threw him in the pit. Like, like Jonah and Daniel, he's trapped, and he's out of options. There ain't no hope. There ain't no exit. But because Jacob's boys are just as greedy as they are mean, they see a caravan coming by, and they decide they're going to make a little money, and they sell him. And even though that road to the palace took a few detours through prison for a reason, Joseph ends up at the throne, and he ends up with his brothers in front of him, and this time they're asking him for something. And Joseph is wise enough to give them what they ask for, not what they deserve. That's how God works. Or here's one you probably never thought about. Look, think about Barabbas. Remember who he is, Barabbas? Barabbas, his final appeal's already been made. He don't have any way to get out of it. His execution's already scheduled. He's sitting in his cell. If he had cards, he's probably playing solitaire. He hasn't got any other way. He's not got any other hope. The decision's already been made, and he's going to die. Jonah and Daniel and Joseph, it's all over but the crying. But not for him, the crying doesn't come because the steps of the warden that's coming to get him, he thinks to execute him, are bringing his street clothes. And the warden says, you're free to go. They want to kill somebody else. The crowd said, crucify. 
crucified Jesus and Barabbas, he gets a, a, get out of, a get out of jail card. These are all true stories. The pastor told us about Lot. That's a scary one, isn't it? Angel knocking on his door telling him to get out of there. God's going to smoke Sodom and Gomorrah. What about when Peter was in jail and the angel shows up and unlocks a door? God always shows up. He's strongest when our efforts are weakest. I want you to look at something about the dialogue that Jesus had with this man at Bethsaida. He said, do you want to be well? What kind of question is that? Do you want to be well? I mean, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? No, not necessarily because unfortunately there are people who don't want to get well. That, as hard as that is to hear, they don't want to receive help. They like being helpless. They like being weak. They've learned to live that way. They like the attention that they get. And they like not having the responsibility for their life. Not everybody, but there are some. There are some people who know there's a way to get well. They just don't want to take it. And hear this. You cannot help someone who does not want to be helped. As much as it hurts you, as much as many of us are fixers, Addie, we fix it, we fix it. You cannot help someone who does not want to be helped. Sometimes people are sick and they just haven't reached the place where this man had. They're not ready to give up on their human efforts. They want to still try to get in the water. And Jesus can really do nothing for them. And maybe that's why he walked by all the other people. But this man at the pool, he wanted to get well. Listen to what he says. I don't have nobody to put me in the pool. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. He's just like, oh, maybe he'll put me in the pool if it moves. In other words, he's saying, yes, I want to be healed. I can. I've tried. I've done everything I know. I ain't got nobody to help me. I haven't got any hope. And there's a lot of people like that, too. They've given up on their situation. They've just settled. They're not living no abundant life. They're actually mad at Christians who live an abundant life. They've just settled for what they've got, and they, just, they don't see any hope. And maybe that's somebody in here. There's all kinds of things that bind us. Maybe you've tried to quit drinking. You know alcohol's running, ruining your life and your family. And maybe it's not a great big problem, but it's a problem, and you know it. You thought you had it under control. You never meant for that drink to be the focus of your every thought because you can't wait to get home. It usually starts when you get home and you have a little drink to just kind of knock the edge off. Women like to call it have a little glass of wine in the tub or whatever, and the next thing you know, that's all you're looking for when you get home because you got to have that drink, and pretty soon that drink is what's going to work in your, in your coffee cup. You didn't mean for it to get control of you, but it does. Sometimes you're taking drugs. And nobody wakes up and says, I think I'm going to be an alcoholic or I'm going to be a drug addict. No, no, you tried experimentally and you just can't get off of it. Or maybe your back's killing you and you start taking out one Tylenol PM, then it goes to the ibuprofen 3, and the next thing you know, you're on Oxycontin. You never meant to get hooked, but that's all you think about. You don't think about nothing else except getting that drug. Drug addicts, they don't wake up wanting to be drug addicts. Maybe you got a problem with lust or pornography and you don't want nobody to know. And you keep trying to quit, but you just can't. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. Maybe you're trying to tell people and nobody really cares. Maybe you're really hopeless. What did Jesus say to this man at the pool? What did he say? Did he say, oh, listen, buddy, man, I'm so sorry. I'm going to be here. I'm going to put you in the water. When, that, when it bubbles, I'm going to put you in first. He did not say that. He didn't offer that kind of help, but we do. Sometimes that's what we just pat you on the back, bless your heart. We'll wait to, I'll pray for you to be blessed. Maybe God sent you to be the blessing. You ever think about that? Jesus does not say what we say when people are hurting. Here's what he said. Here's three things that Jesus said. Number one, he asked the impossible. Number two, he removes all possibility of a relapse. And number three, he expects continued success. Jesus said, stand, pick up your mat, and walk. Not too complicated. It says immediately, not 
Two days later, immediately this man was healed. And he did that. He picked up his mat and he took off. He was walking. Notice the first thing that Jesus says is what the man cannot do himself. He can't do that. He hadn't done it for 38 years. This is a critical clue to, that many people miss when they're looking for help from God. There is always something that God will want you to believe or do or act upon. We have an active part in what God wants us to do. Jesus doesn't say, listen, buddy, we're going to try to build your faith up. We're going to try to do this. No. He looks him straight in the eye and he says, rise, stand up. So when his will, when Jesus' will, hear this, oh, hear this. When Jesus' will matches with your will, power shoots up from heaven. Please hear that. Whether it's healing, whether it's ministry, whether it's stepping out in faith, when your will aligns with God's will, mighty, powerful things can happen. I don't know if the man felt anything. I just know he did what God said. He stood up and he walked. His muscles come back together and he was walking. And then what did Jesus say? He said, take up your mat. Why would he say that? He might have said that because the man might have said to himself, you know what, <laughs> I'm healed now, but you know, I might need to go back there tomorrow if this don't last. How many times have you come to the altar and laid it before the Lord and picked it back up before you ever got to your car? Because the enemy said that didn't really happen. You didn't get touched. You wouldn't have had no temper tantrum if you'd got touched. No, you got to remember when he touches you, you, t you pick up your mat and you don't have a way to go back. Many people fell right here. They want to get well. Here's what God's saying. If I heal you from alcohol, you go home and you pour that alcohol down the drain. Don't you say, well, I don't need it right now because your mind and your body and the enemy will start talking you into one more drink. If you got drugs and you want to get off of it and you come up and you feel like the Lord has touched you, then you get rid of them drugs. If you got people in your life that's not good for you and you've asked the Lord to deliver you, do not go back to that crowd. That's what Jesus meant when he said, pick up your mat. We're not going back to where we were. Burn your bridges. Many times a person who's been touched, I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen. We go to a women's encounter, and I mean the good encounters, they laying some stuff down. I mean, nailing it to the cross. I don't know what you men do, but we are having some good ones. And then we lay it all out, and two weeks later, we picked it back up, and we're just as burdened. It says in the Word, if you get clean and you don't fill it back up with God, seven more demons will come in. You can't leave it empty. It's going to get filled up with something. The third thing is Jesus said, walk. He did not say, come here and I'm going to carry you out now. Come on, hop on. He said, walk. So many times people want to be carried after they're healed. They want everybody to gather around them and keep them picked up. And when people get tired and they can't keep them picked up, they fall out. When Jesus says, walk, he doesn't mean be carried. He means walk with me, not with people. Don't look to the people. Don't look to everybody else. You look to me. Now, yes, we can have people hold us accountable. We should. If we've made a commitment, get an accountability partner. But don't depend on that person to be your savior. So many times in marriages, we want our partner to fix us or save us or keep us in a good mood or help us. That's not what God intended marriage to be. God intended both partners to look to him and then we help each other. So if you get healed and God touches you, you pick up your mat and you walk. And that's what kept this man walking, you and the Lord. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith. That's what kept the man going. I wish we'd do that. I wish we'd take Jesus at his word. Quit second guessing. I wish that when he tells us to stand, that we'd stand up. I wish when he says you are forgiven, 
that you would lay that guilt down and not drag it around. And I wish when you felt like you are not valuable and he says you are mine, that you'd stand up and straighten your crown and you'd walk like you are a daughter or a son of the Most High. Every day you should be building yourself up so when you walk out there, you've got your armor on and you know who you, who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, you will fall flat on your face when the enemy comes against you. I wish that when he said, my love is eternal, walk with me, it's eternal, we would give up our fear. When I came close and facing death, there was a moment when I got a little scared, but I, I felt his peace say, no, you're not going to be afraid. Because when you die, it's, it's win either way. You open your eyes, you're in heaven. You're, you know, either way you win, so we should not walk with fear. Fear and faith cannot be in the same room. When he says we're provided for, why do we worry? Why do we worry when, we, when he tells us, I will take care of it? He hears the desires of your heart. Do you know, I was telling a lady at lunch today, I was telling her, he hears the desires of your heart. Ask him for what you're wanting. I remember when I found out I got to come back to Rio East and Marty and I had talked about it, I was cleaning house one day, and this, I, this came out of my mouth. I wish I had not left. I loved teaching that Wednesday night class. I said those words, where am I now? God hears those things. He hears the desires of your heart. If you're invalid, if you're paralyzed, if you're lame, if you're blind, if you're hopeless, if you're depressed, if you're lonely, he hears that. He wants to touch you. He wants to love you. He wants you to trust him. When he says stand up, stand up and get ready to walk a whole new life. The gentle stranger that touched that man at Bethsaida is the same gentle stranger that touches your life. If your life is not what it needs to be, if you're lonely and depressed and you ain't living the abundant life by any means, then you are not lined up with the Lord because the Lord touches and blesses those whom he loves. Your circumstances do not determine your happiness. When Peter and Paul were in prison and they were being beaten and stoned and all the other things, they still looked unto the Lord. What did they see that's different than what we see? Yes, it's 2,000 years later. What can you show a hopeless and dying world to get them to want to come and know the Savior that's touched your life? That's what being a child of God is all about. You have the remedy. You may be an invalid at one time, but you're not anymore. God has healed you for a reason, and that's so that you can go out and touch a world that's hurting and dying, and you can be Jesus to the invalids in your life. Father God, we come to you right now. I have felt your presence in such a mighty way. Lord, challenge us. Help us not to be children of yours that are ashamed or weak or scared. Help us to stand up, to rise up and take up whatever it is that's holding us back, to be warriors, to fill this place so that people come together so a community wants to know you, so one soul, one soul can be saved. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Jesus, we honor you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Work among us. Help us to be who you created. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Miss Doris. Wonderful, wonderful teaching. Is Facebook still on?